Tonight on KPBS Evening Edition, dockless scooter regulations are once again up for debate in San Diego. What we found is that the injury rate is on par with what bicycles do. What the city is proposing to make the travel trend safer. Plus, the Navy is taking steps to improve private military housing conditions following complaints. The changes being made. And lending a helping hand to the homeless community through haircuts. Details on the pop-up barbershop. KPBS Evening Edition starts right now. Good evening. It's Tuesday, April 23rd. Thanks for joining us. I'm Ebony Monet. After multiple accidents, the San Diego City Council discusses regulations for dockless scooters and bikes once again. KPBS Metro reporter Andrew Bowen says the goal is to increase safety. The proposed ordinance would require bike and scooter sharing companies to automatically slow down speeds in high pedestrian areas. They'll also have three hours to respond to reports of abandoned or illegally parked devices. Before the vote, supporters and representatives from scooter companies Lime and Bird held a group ride to City Hall. They say the devices can reduce congestion and greenhouse gas emissions and that everyone will be safer if scooter riders have a safe place to ride on the street. Of course, bicycles, scooters, and e-bikes are the most vulnerable kind of transportation on our roads. And what's important to understand is that when we have the infrastructure that allows the safe adoption of it, so like our bike lanes, our protected bike lanes are even better, those injuries would go down. Dockless scooters and bikes have exploded in popularity across San Diego over the past year. Skeptics say reckless riders on sidewalks are posing a safety hazard. Some have called for tougher rules than what the mayor has proposed. Others want a complete ban on the devices. Another element of the proposal is data sharing. Companies would have to share anonymous trip data to help understand where safety improvements and enforcement are most needed. Andrew Bowen, KPBS News. For more details on the vote, go to kpbs.org. After a wide range of complaints about private military housing, new deadlines are going into effect. KPBS military reporter Steve Walsh describes how this is affecting sailors here in San Diego. The Navy has held public meetings with families living in private military housing. Navy spokesperson Caitlin Rose Ostemel says they've heard a range of complaints in San Diego. So what we're hearing is that there are some issues with general maintenance, some potential pest infestation in some numbers. Um, people are having issues with their neighbors. And we have seen that there seems to be a perception that the Navy is not as involved as we should be. Across the country, there have been allegations of mold and slow response by private contractors, which run most of military housing. Sarah Lynn Klein, a spokesperson with Military Housing Advocacy Network, says She's not expecting immediate results. A light won't come on. I think that it's like a dimmer switch. It'll start slowly getting brighter and brighter as the months will come. Only 94 households in San Diego requested an inspection by their commander by the April 15 deadline set by the Navy. The Navy is following up with a special tenant survey, which is due April 30th. At any time, a sailor can reach out to their command and say, hey, I'm having trouble with my housing office. I'm not getting the service that I feel I should get. The chain of command is there to support the sailor. The Navy says it has about 9,100 military housing units in San Diego. The vast majority are in the community, outside of one of the area's Navy bases, which makes the situation more complicated for tenants who are used to living on base. Steve Walsh, KPBS News. The Navy says the results of the survey and the inspections will be part of a national report on the state of military housing. Congressman Duncan Hunter challenged Democrats to move on after the release of the Mueller report. There was no obstruction. Um, th there was no collusion. That was the outcome. It's time to move on. And I think it's time for Democrats to start doing something instead of trying to Im impeach the president. It's time for them to get something done. If it's the Green New Deal, then let's see him work on, on that. If it's something else, let's see him start working on getting stuff done for the country, not just trying to impeach the president. That's now been cleared by a, by a two-year-long investigation. But, you but, but Congressman, the one thing that this Mueller report did not do, it did not exonerate the president. Yes, it did. Yeah. I would disagree with you. Yes, it did. It's there over. Let it die. It's over. I know that the media hates it to be over, but it's over. Sorry, media. Aren't you 
Hunter joined the San Diego delegation for a congressional luncheon today. Some Democrats in Congress are trying to get a hold of a full unredacted report. They also want Attorney General William Barr and Special Counsel Robert Mueller to testify before Congress. SDSU offers meningitis vaccinations following another confirmed case on campus. Last week, the university confirmed a student was diagnosed with the infection. County health officials declared a meningitis outbreak at SDSU in October of 2018. However, it's unknown whether this case is connected to that outbreak. Bacterial meningitis is rare but can be deadly. Symptoms include rashes, stick neck and fever. Today, the pop-up vaccination clinic was open on campus for all students. It's been a few cases within the fraternities at SDSU, but I feel like it's not super like outbreak yet. I'm getting it just to be safe because I do a lot of volunteering and just I don't like to take risks. So I, I just got it for the better. University and county health officials urge all undergraduate students 23 years old or younger to get vaccinated. Talks to impose stronger rules on plastic bags, containers, and other utensils in Imperial Beach. The City Council will discuss the idea during a meeting on May 1st. The proposal is supported by Mayor Serge Dedina. He says the current rules are not effective when it comes to reducing pollution. Many large retailers now sell thicker reusable plastic bags to comply with state law. Father Joe's is opening a barber shop. KPBS reporter Matt Hoffman says the haircuts from one of the region's largest providers of homeless services are uniquely free. The shop is called Village Clips and is located inside Father Joe's main campus downtown. Inside, they can do two haircuts at a time. Backers of the project say this will help people restore their dignity and self-esteem. If you're well groomed, you feel good about yourself. And then also as you go out on interviews, you look better as well. So it's, it's, uh, it's important. Stephen Neal says he's been living on the streets for the last six months. Yeah, it means a lot to be able to get cleaned up and be presentable. He heard about the free haircuts from a friend and jumped at the opportunity. Make you feel, feel more human again, you know? Make you feel a lot better, and especially about yourself and everything else. You don't want to go around, you know, embarrassed to talk to people because you you know, you look bad. Neil says he's in the process of looking for a job. Try to go speak with uh, a few people that, about some work. Then you can work on, get a job, then you can work on getting getting something else, you know, a place off the street. So just about a half an inch, right? Father Joe's Villages plans to have the barbershop open seven days a week. In the morning for a couple of hours every day and during the afternoon on weekdays. The haircuts are done by volunteers like Anna Creasy, who owns Anna's Hair Design in Kearney Mesa. Now you can apply for modeling. <laughs> Funding for the shop came from a private donor, as well as some grant money from the city of San Diego. Right there? Okay, perfect. The haircuts aren't just for people who stay in Father Joe's housing complex. The shop is open for all people who are homeless. They don't have to reside with us. They can just be on the street and they can come in and, and get a haircut, as well as a shower as well. Would you like me to braid it afterwards? Matt Hoffman, KPBS News. The barbershop is staffed by volunteers, but Father Joe says it will need a lot of stylists to keep it open seven days a week. A new bill will give domestic violence victims more time to come forward. The measure would extend the statute of limitations for domestic violence crimes from 3 to 20 years if certain criteria are met. Under the bill, officials must obtain sufficient evidence or three or more victims must come forward. Lawmakers say this measure will give victims a chance to report the claims when they're ready. Current law is flawed and is only meant to protect our abusers. Let's not make the statute of limitation one more hurdle that an already broken, traumatized victim has to jump. The bill will also include new training techniques for peace officers on handling incidents of domestic violence. Sales of electric cars in California topped $2 million for the fourth straight year. That's according to the California New Car Dealer Association. From the KPBS Climate Change Desk, KPBS Roundtable host Mark Sauer takes a closer look at the reality of electric cars in the Golden State. Joining me is Brett Williams, Senior Principal Advisor for Transportation at the Center for Sustainable Energy. Welcome, Brett. Thank you. 
We'll start with these uh, encouraging numbers on electric vehicles. What do they tell you? What do they mean to you? Well, I, I think it is an exciting time for the electric car. Uh, there are 1.2 million electric vehicles in the United States. A lot of people perhaps don't know that. Even in San Diego County, there's over 30,000 electric vehicles, which is more than five or six states in the country. Uh, a big news story of last year was the Tesla Model 3, which was the sixth best-selling electric vehicle. Well, actually, it's the sixth best-selling car, not just clean car, and it helped really bring Tesla closer to the mainstream market. And the last thing I'd say, really the, the less sexy but equally important story behind the Model 3 was the mainstreaming of the electric car. There are now over 40 options from all major automakers, and those include not just small cars, but large cars, crossover SUVs, a minivan, and, and of course some of the fastest cars ever made. So uh, it's a pretty exciting time. And the, the automakers are talking about bringing out even more lines as we move forward. Trucks is, a, is an area, small trucks perhaps. That's right, and trucks is a little bit of a challenge with the towing uh, optimization problem, but they're working on it hard. They know that will open up a whole new segment of the consumer market as well. Right, as a former small truck owner, I wish they'd just get a small truck and didn't worry about the towing, so I'd just throw the golf clubs and the plywood with in the back and the bikes. Right, and there are a couple of companies that are taking a Tesla-like approach. Rivian's coming out with an all-electric uh, luxury performance pickup truck in the next couple of years, and so we'll see some glimmers of that soon. So a lot more to look forward to. Now, speaking of the vehicles themselves, mm -hmm. a big push is, uh, or, or a big promotion for the sales of them is the range is so much better than it used to be just a few years ago. That's right. We really have kind of turned a corner in the electric vehicle market with this new product class, which is the long-range battery electric vehicle. You always had the plug in hybrid electric vehicles, so you didn't have to worry about electric range if you didn't want to, but now those battery electric cars are fully capable, and they typically drive over 200 miles per charge, and for most people who drive on average 30 miles per day, that's, that's more than enough just to plug into an outlet at home, and you're good to go the next day. All right, an election year coming up, of course. Can this be a winning issue for presidential candidates? Push more tax incentives, or reverse rollbacks on efficiency standards by the current administration, all tied up in that? It, it can, because uh, electric fuel is local fuel. Electric cars like Tesla are made in California. A lot of uh, jobs related to electric vehicles are local and high paying and skilled jobs. So it certainly can. I think there's a lot of automakers who so long as they have clear, consistent policy signals, they're ready to line up behind very aggressive goals like the state has. The state has a goal to put five million electric vehicles on the roads by 2030 on our pathway to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions to the point we might need to do so, say, 80% reduction by 2050. And a series of governors in California, for example, you know, regulations going all the way back to the 90s, but Schwarzenegger, Brown, and now Newsom have all uh, lined up strongly and clearly behind these policy signals that support the automakers doing the right thing so that they can focus on getting the products out and the consumers can become aware and buy these cars. And California, as you say, has been a leader in this. What about other states? Are we seeing this spread to other places in the country? We are. So we administer statewide electric vehicle rebates, not just in California, but in New York, Massachusetts, Connecticut, and soon in Oregon. So primarily you're seeing it a little bit more on the coast than in the center of the country. Those states have all signed up for similar California-like regulations. And so an automaker or a state can sign up either to the California standards or they can stand up, sign up to the national standards. And so those states that are adopting the California standards are really seeing the focus of the supply a lot of the products are nationwide, but of course the automakers are going to focus their marketing and supply on those states that have the policies that support it, which is why California has been able to grab a lot of those early sales. Well, I've been speaking with Brett Williams, Senior Principal Advisor with, for Transportation at San Diego Center for Sustainable Energy. Thanks, Brett. My pleasure. I'm Judy Woodruff. Tonight on the News Hour, the Supreme Court hears arguments on the controversial issue of whether the census can ask people if they are U.S. citizens. Coming up at 7 after Evening Edition on KPBS. 10% of African American students at Hoover High School have been suspended at least once. They also lag behind their peers in English and math scores. As KPBS reporter Priya Shreeder reports, there's now a new program helping African American males achieve excellence. 
It's lunchtime at Hoover High School in City Heights. Start it off. Okay. And while most kids are hanging out with their friends, this group of teenagers has decided to participate in a new program called Brothers of Excellence. As majority black males, we're stereotyped and we're put into categories that says we need to be able to throw a ball to be something in life. Armani Hamlin is in the 11th grade. It really resonated with me that I would be able to be with other people from my school who are more like me. Out of the more than 2,000 students on the Hoover campus, only around 100 are African American. But as always, we do have a guest speaker. Some teachers and staff said they wanted to create a space where African American men could learn about their history and be inspired by mentors from the community. We have more people coming because they're spreading the word. Robert Spriggs has worked in security at the school for 13 years. He, along with other school staff, helped start the program. There's maybe a handful of African-American male role models on this campus, and so uh, I wanted to enlighten the young men uh, by, you know, being positive and doing some things around here that can help them to see who they are and who that they can become. How you guys doing? Uh... Today, that role model is James Williams. The Navy veteran says he spent years of his childhood homeless, dropped out of school, and joined a gang, but was able to turn his life around thanks to a teacher who believed in him. I am hoping that I can uh, let them know that there is an opportunity, there is a way out of whatever their situation may be if they take advantage of their time now. The program is also hoping to tackle some of the challenges African American students face in school. Three out of four in the state of California are not reading at grade level, according to the Department of Education. One of my biggest regrets was not studying abroad while I was in college. Ronald Preston Clark is a student teacher at the school, and he helps lead the program every Wednesday. Uh, one thing we always like to come back to is that literacy element and that literacy component where they understand that if they read literature that looks like them, that speaks to them, um, one, it will make them a lover of reading, and then secondly, it would allow them to explore identities that they might not be able to otherwise. Many of the students, like 11th grader Sala Isa, say they feel more comfortable talking about their issues at school with other students who are like them. It feels like family, like everyone is like open and share their feelings, emotions, and it just makes you want to progress and be like a better human being for the community. Armani Hamlin says it has inspired him to give back to the community when he graduates. I hope to always have this resonate with me and one day when I become super successful, come back and uh, help fur furnish this group and help it grow. So another student who's probably like me sees someone like me and thinks, wow, I can do that. The school staff, like Spriggs, says he hopes it can empower students to see African-American men in a positive way. Just look on the news. Young men are being slain either by the hand of other black men or by the police. So. Uh, I'd rather uh, get them in a situation where I can uh, pour into them and empower them to make better decisions and better choices with their lives. Hoover High is a school of 2,000 kids with limitless potential, but they don't know it. That's why this club's necessary. This club gets, right now, we're looking at around 30 students to look further than just high school and know what they want to do in life. Building a brotherhood to chase their dreams. I can, I can, I will, I will, I must. I must. Priya Shreether, KPBS News. The American Academy of Pediatrics recommends reading aloud to children every day starting at infancy. In fact, early literacy has been linked to academic success. To help with those efforts locally, United Healthcare is donating 8,000 books to area nonprofits. And here to tell us more about the donations is Monique Knight with United Healthcare. Welcome. Thank you. So can you tell me how would this program fit into United Healthcare's overall mission? Sure. Well, our mission is really to help people live healthier lives. And we know that a lot goes into healthcare and keeping a healthy lifestyle other than just getting to the doctor. There are a lot of social factors that affect one's overall health and well-being, and literacy is one of those social issues. So today was an exciting day today. Thank you for coming in and making time for us. Can you tell us a little bit more about what happened today? 
Absolutely. So United Healthcare has donated 24 reading stations and 8,000 books to nonprofit organizations and healthcare organizations that serve the low-income population. And this is really just part of our effort to promote literacy and early reading amongst the low-income um, population. And can you tell us more about the organizations actually receiving um, these donations? So it's Vista Community Clinic in uh, Vista and Oceanside. And then the other is Episcopal Community Services and their Head Start program. So um, ECS, Episcopal Community Services, they essentially run a Head Start program for kids ages three to five years old that come from low income backgrounds. And many times these families have zero books available to their kids at home. So through our donation, each child served through the Head Start program under ECS will have a book to take home. So how does this differ from, from say, a library? Could you expand on the, the reading stations? What exactly are the reading stations? Yes, yeah, so the reading stations are physical table and chair sets that can be set up in the classrooms or in patient waiting areas. And this really just gives a child a quiet place to go, pick up a book, um, they can even draw at the stations, just an opportunity for them to uh, use their imagination and expand their creativity. And how exciting was today's event? It was fabulous. Um, it just brought such a joy to my soul to see the kids running to the books. They were very excited. Um, we were able to read to them, have story time, and they were just so engaged. These little minds are just so hungry um, for, you know, the the story time and closeness that they receive during these reading sessions. Literacy, any ties to literacy and poor health or, or why is this so important? Well, if you think about the life cycle, so kids who are read to at home tend to do better in school. And students who do well in school tend to be more successful in life in general. So really what we're doing by instilling literacy and reading skills at an early age is setting them up for success later in life. Awesome. Monique, thank you so much. Thank you. Well, it's definitely feeling like spring outside. Meteorologist Aaron Calandra tells us just how long we can expect this heat and sunshine. We are really seeing some beautiful weather here in San Diego and surrounding areas over the next couple of days. Here is our satellite and radar. There is nothing going on. We are going to be under a very dry pattern here, and that's the case for much of California, getting a nice break. Now, we still have that onshore flow. So right along the coast, we still have those clouds in the morning breaking up for sunshine by the afternoon. So for tonight, we'll be at 60 degrees in the metro, increasing clouds, and again, they'll be lingering in those morning time hours. Oceanside at 53, Ramona 47 degrees for the low, Chula Vista at 56, and Brago Springs in those mid 60s. And for tomorrow, unseasonably warm. It's going to be pretty warm, dry. Uh, we're talking in the deserts, like Palm Springs, for example, in the hundreds already. And right along the coast, of course, with that influence from the Pacific, we stay much more comfortable. Temperatures are going to be mostly in the 70s. Oceanside at 72, San Diego also at 72 degrees, a bit warmer in the interior areas. Ramona, 83, and El Cajon at 85 degrees. Mount Laguna looking good, very pleasant. 70 degrees with sunshine, but check out Borrego Springs. We are flirting with 100 degrees. So for this week, expect to see nothing but pleasant conditions. Here we are, Big Ridge. That means we're going to stay dry and warm. Nothing really happening around here. For the coast, we're in the 70s. We do get just a little bit cooler by Sunday at 68 degrees. Now at this point, there is a chance we could see a shower popping up Sunday night into Monday, but that's pretty far away. So we'll keep you posted on that one. Inland, it's gonna remain dry and sunny, getting a little bit cooler and more pleasant for the weekend in those upper 70s. And in the deserts, boy, it is just steamy. We're talking close to 100 degrees much of this week, but by the weekend, we get a break in those upper 80s and in the mountains expect to see our temperatures in the 70s and upper 60s looking pretty pleasant. For KPBS News, I'm Erin Calandra. Back to you. Now for a recap of tonight's top stories. After a wide range of complaints about private military housing, a new protocol is going into effect. Residents complain about pest infestations, maintenance problems, and issues with their neighbors. The Navy has now set deadlines to respond.
SDSU offers meningitis vaccinations following another confirmed case on campus. Last week, the university confirmed a student was diagnosed with the infection. Today, the pop-up vaccination clinic was open for all students on campus. Bacterial meningitis is rare but can be deadly. Symptoms include rashes, stiff neck, and fever. A new bill will give domestic abuse victims more time to come forward. The measure would extend the statute of limitations for domestic violence crimes from 3 to 20 years. The bill also includes new training techniques for peace officers handling incidents of domestic violence. Now here's a look at what we're working on for tomorrow in the KPBS newsroom on Morning Edition. A UC San Diego eye doctor is under the microscope following an investigation into his practices. We take a deeper dive. And on Midday Edition, a new report shows more people over the age of 65 are continuing to work. We take a look at why they're putting off retirement. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us. Have a great night.